Well, welcome to Talking Maine with the Bowtie Boys. I'm Tom Saviello. We have a special show today, one about sustainability and recycling. And I have a special guest who, who are you? Hi, Tom. Ray Dewey, um, sustainability manager for the Coca-Cola Bottling Company of Northern New England. Ray, welcome. I mean, you and I ran into each other when at the State House, and you made this presentation to me, and Newell Auger, our good friend, pulled me out and said, you need to see this. And at my first words to you, you need to come do my TV show with you. So I really <laughs> want to thank you and Coca-Cola for, for coming on the show, not as an advertisement, but just to talk about what has been done, because so many people worry about plastic bottles, they worry about recycling, they worry about sustainability, they worry about our planet, they worry about our community and you can show some of the different things that we do. So I'm just gonna follow you as we go through this great demonstration of different things that we have here at the table. All right, well, let me start off with who we are. We're um, Coca-Cola Bottom Company of Northern New England. We're a franchise bottler, just like a McDonald's franchise. We're not owned by the big Coke company. Um, we're a franchisee. Most of the US used to be franchises. It's a lot smaller now. There's a smaller group of us now, but we are still independent franchises. And for us, we're based out of our corporate offices in Bedford, New Hampshire. Um, what we're doing here, you know, what, what people need to think about is we're also, we also live in our communities, we're also concerned about the planet. And what, we, what I've done over the last few years, and the company's been great with helping me with, is we have a lot of material that we're, le we're left over with at the end of the day. And what we try to do is find the best places for that material, and one of the neat things about being up here in the Northeast is we have a lot of manufacturing up here in the Northeast that actually uses our material to do their jobs. And I think that's fascinating as you and I have talked, you're going to talk about that because right. they're, they're places that you people didn't know about or they know the name brand but didn't realize they were made here. Exactly. Or how they were made. Exactly. Now this presentation that we've put together, I do this a lot in school, so it's kind of built around um, working with kids and kids like things that are colorful and they can touch and feel, but there's also a lot of real name brand items on this table that are partners of, of us and we'll touch it with, on those as we go through this. But what we normally do is we start off with things like plastic trays. We use a lot of plastic trays to deliver a lot of our products. And the neat thing about these are you can use them over and over and over again, save on trees. We also use plastic pallets. Um, this is very unique in the system. Not a lot of companies do this. Most people don't realize that 40% of the oak trees that get cut down in this country every year go to make an oak pallet. The life of that oak pallet is three uses. At that point, the so forklifts broken. have broken the boards, twisted them, and all that stuff. And unfortunately, most of those end up in landfills. Okay? We don't feel that's great use for oak trees. So we spent the money. It's very expensive to get into these things. But once you're into plastic pallets, you basically can use them forever. If they don't break up with the forklift as easily. No, they're, they're pretty rugged. And at times, they do break. Um, track trails will run over them. Same thing with our trays. That's usually the biggest thing that they'll be outside of a location and the trailer will back up over the pallet or over the tray or something like that. We'll actually store them all up until we have a truckload. And then we'll ship them back to Rear Rig in Pennsylvania where they'll grind them up, melt them down, make them into new and they come right back to us. Wow. We've been doing this for actually well, 17 so let me just years. Stop you so if that gets broken up, you send it to the person yep. who made it. They it gets recycled right back. back. Wow. wow. Yep. Fascinating. One of the things most people need to realize is the cheapest thing to make your product out of is itself. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, that's, that's, that's why it goes back. Pallets and trays, we've actually been doing this for 17 years. And in 17 years, we've saved about 154 million pounds of cardboard and 272,000 oak trees. And that's just our little franchise. That's not the whole Coke company. Wow. So we're pretty proud of that. They should be. Um, pretty much everything we use during the course of our day to do our jobs, at the end of the day when we're done with it, somebody's looking to buy that from us to start their day. And being in the Northeast, we have a lot of manufacturing up here that wants that material. You know, it's interesting, I, I just did a presentation to the committee and I told them, I said, you know, another person's tra treasure is someone else's trash. Ax absolutely. And, and that we shouldn't consider trash until it's finally at its final end use product when it can't be made into something else and we need to think about it as materials, byproducts, uh, not byproducts, mater raw materials for someone else's manufacturing. Right, and actually we can talk about that end piece that you just mentioned when we're at the end of the, okay. the presentation. Okay. Um, but some of the other things we use during the day to do our jobs. Um, in our coolers you'll find a lot of glides. You take a bottle out, the next bottle slides down. Well, they get worn, they get broken and all that stuff. When those are broken, we actually collect them up and we have a buyer in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a great company called Poly Recovery. This is a great story. These were four guys started this business back a couple years ago and they specialize in plastic. 
and reprocessing it and use, putting it back out there to be reused. And their company philosophy is everything within 100 miles. Wow. So they take it in within 100 miles, but they put it back out there to manufacturing within 100 miles. And up here in the Northeast, you can do that, okay? So they actually take, they, they buy these glides when they're broken from us, they'll shred them up, sell it right back to another ma local manufacturer who will melt it down, make it into something new, and it goes right back out there. It doesn't necessarily go back out as a slide. No, it'll go out there as who knows what. Yeah. Um, this is a neat, neat thing. This is shrink wrap. Every time we make a delivery, the pallet's wrapped in shrink wrap. Okay, so we use a lot of this. When the driver delivers, he cuts this off, bundles it up, brings it back. We actually bail all this up, and we sell it to Trex Decking right in Pennsylvania. Huh. And that's what they make out of that. No, Composite kidding. decking you'll, you'll see on your porch in your house. Yeah. That's, what that, uh, that's where it goes. So that's made out of this? Yeah, and we throw our redemption bags in there. We throw like the overwrap from a case of water, that plastic overwrap that, will, you know, if we get any of that, that goes in there. And these guys will buy everything. They're desperate for the material. Out of everybody on this table, I get more phone calls for shrink wrap than anything else. No kidding. Wow. And the homeowner can actually recycle a lot of this stuff too. You can't put it in your curbside bin Whoops. because it, in your bin, the machinery, when it gets into the, the plants, it, like it, in yes. port, yeah, yeah. it gets into the gears and it ruins it. But put it in with your grocery bags. The bags you're going to take back to Hannaford, right? Put your bread bags in there, your English muffin bags, your clean saran wrap. You can put all that in there, take it back to the grocery store, and it goes right back into the system. Oh, so those were the, that's where they send those <coughs> plastic bags to to be made into that stuff. They'll go back into making bags, shrink wrap, or... Oh, that's Trex very decking. good to know because that is, we, we've just got a single sort in Wilton. Yeah. And one of the things we can't take are shrink wrap or plastic bags. They just really go into the trash right now. But so we, we have the perfect system for it. Already in place. If already we take in place. those, put them in the, into the Hannaford bags, or Walmart bags, or whatever it is. And, yep. and they're all required by law to have a place to recycle exactly. that stuff, which people forget about. And they can put it in there. It'll go off and be made into decking. Right back material. to these companies. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. <laughs> I learned something today. That's new. Cardboard. We do use cardboard boxes for certain things. Any cardboard we use, we get back, we bail it up. We actually sell it to Parker Brothers in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. They make games. They, they make Monopoly boards, game boxes, all that kind of stuff. Wow. Well. So that's why it's interesting for the kids. We, our connections to these companies, you know, really bring out things that kids, re kids recognize. Did you know Milton Bradley was born in Vianna, Maine? No, I didn't. That's right. That's with the Milton Bradley, the Vianna Historical Society is in Milton Bradley's house. So that's some of the game boards. Wow, that's, that's, that's great. Doing. That's cool. Something else that's fascinating. This is strapping, okay? In our production plant in Londonderry, New Hampshire, where we bottle everything, where all our freight comes in, there's a lot of this. We have a lot of this that comes in holding the freight together. Um, we actually cut this off and we box it up and we actually sell it to these same guys, Poly Recovery huh. in Portsmouth. And what Poly Recovery does, what they do is they, they grind things. That's, that's what the, their company focuses. They grind up and then they prepare it for somebody else to use. So they grind this up really small and then basically this is what fascinates people they sell it to Foss Manufacturing. Foss Manufacturing is a great company right in Hampton, New Hampshire. 500 plus employees, huge facility, they make an incredible amount of fabric every week. What they do with that shredded material is they actually melt it and they stretch it until it gets really really thin and they crimp it. Now it's fuzzy just like wool or cotton. Hmm. Okay. Wow. So they take this and they spin it into a thread. And then that thread, they actually weave it into a fabric. Huh. Now, from Hampton, New Hampshire, they sell that fabric 12 miles down the road to New Balance and in Lawrence, a, Massachusetts. We have a New Balance facility up here in Maine, too. Yeah. Exactly. Huh. And that's what the upper part of this is all made from. Oh, no kidding. So, that's so it starts out in our building in London, New Hampshire, like this, and ends up in Lawrence, Massachusetts, looking like that. Wow. And it's all done right here in our local economy, local jobs. It stays right here. So this is plastic. It's plastic. It's not uh, uh, fabric or anything. Although no. you, it looks like a fabric if you look at what that does. And for those at home, that, I can tell you that it feels, feels just like, like cotton or wool. Feels, feels like wool. Right. I mean, it feels like wool. And this certainly feels like wool as a wool shoe. Huh. That's really fascinating. Wow. Mm -hmm. Huh. It's amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, last year. We process six and a half million pounds of used bottles. Okay, we have six bailing centers in our territory. All right, three of them up here in Maine. And what we do is the bottles that we pick up back from the redemption centers, we actually bail them up. And we ship them by tractor trailer load to Albany, New York. Now, once these 
bottles get to Albany, they actually take our bales and break them apart and actually color separate the plastics. So they'll separate the green from the clear. Okay. Now, once they've got it color separated, then they chop it up. Okay. If you want to recycle your cap, there's this old school thing about you can't leave the cap on there. If you want to recycle your cap, leave it on. Really? Because now it gets chopped up in here. And that's how we're going to capture it back. Because when this gets washed, at one stage, all the caps will float to the top. Oh, no kidding. So these will get skimmed off, and these actually go back to a cap company in Massachusetts made into new caps again. <laughs> and then we'll buy them back. So, theory, so, and I do it at home. I mean, I take my caps off. So, I mean, I just not, don't want to talk about what's inside, but it's better for me to leave the cap Absolutely. on when I take it back to the recycling if center you, up here. If you take it off and put it in, it's too small. It's going to get lost, lost with the trash. The yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So if you leave it on there, it gets, it gets chopped up, it's in the mix, and once, once they have the mix, then, then as the, they, go, they go through the wash process, different temperatures, different things will float out. And that's how they capture the cap. Oh, no kidding. Huh. Even though it's shredded up, it Even will though float. it's shredded up. Wow. Yeah. Now, once you've got it all washed, and you've got just the bottle left, right? This is what is in massive shortage in the Northeast. There's a huge shortage of this, okay? For us, the companies that buy this in the Northeast, you're looking at them right here. We're talking North Face, Patagonia, all of that fleece for North Face, all of that fabric for Patagonia is all made by Polar Tech in Lawrence, Massachusetts in Hudson, New Hampshire. So my, my North Face jacket is plastic? Yeah. Huh. Wow. And people think, okay, it doesn't feel like plastic. It feels like cotton or wool. But it actually is. It's polyester. And the cheapest thing to make polyester out of is number one plastic. Wow. So when you look at that little when you look at that recycling symbol on the bottle and you see that triangle with the one in the middle, that's where this goes. And is that really mostly these bottles that are number ones? No, it's actually a lot more than that. And that's one of the things that we stress in our presentation. Um, that number one symbol is pretty much a lot of your food industry stuff. See, PET polyethylene terephthalate. Um, that's, that's a what, big word. Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. glad you said My it. daughter, the chemist, could explain it to you, but I'll leave that for her. Um, that's that number one in, this, in the triangle. That's what, that's what that is. And that's what our bottles are made from. But it's also what things like this egg crate are made from, as well as that tomato container right there, the Parmesan cheese bottle, all your salad dressing bottles, your mayonnaise jars, your ketchup bottles. It's all number one PET. The reason why the food industry uses it is because PET is naturally antibacterial. Germs hate it. Ah. So it's perfect for the food industry. And that's why they use it. So these little things that I get my little tomatoes in in the wintertime or my Parmesan cheese, good Italian cheese, we exactly. like that, is that that's made from this number one and that, uh, and, and it, it, it all like, goes right, right back, back into like this. Wow. And, that's there, and there's a massive shortage of that in the Northeast. Mm. So it's the same process what we talked about earlier. They take the flake, they melt it down, they stretch it, crimp it, they turn it into a fiber, and this is actually uni uni Unify Reprieve fiber, okay? This is what Polartec uses to make your North Face jacket fleece, to make all the uh, fabric for Patagonia, as well as fabric for a bunch of other great companies. This is where our bottles end up. Huh. And it's, these fabrics are all made in Lawrence, Massachusetts, in Hudson, New Hampshire. So our stuff comes right back here. It stays here, stays in our local economy. So they're able to dye it too and make the yep, colors? Yeah, they can dye it. Um, when they color separate, the clear obviously has a higher value to it because you can do anything with it. The greens, you know, you can dye them darker. But that's what this material is going into, and that's what these companies are having a massive, sh massive shortage of. So let me make a connection for the audience at home. Okay. Is that these are the bottle I go buy my Coke at the store, right. and I drink it, and I go take it back, and I get my nickel back. That goes into the bag that I work with my good friend Noel. That we, mm -hmm. we make a deposit on. We take that, and that now comes to you guys, or to, right. and that now is sent to the facility in Albany, be, in Albany, to be chopped up and ultimately made into. So, at home, I mean, some people ask me because I remember as a kid it used to be glass, and I used right. to think they would go wash them out, refill them, and send them back out again. They don't do that to the plastic bottles; no. they actually reuse them and continue them in the cycle throughout the process. Correct. Very and, interesting. And when I talk about shortages of this material up here. You know, again, it's, it's not just our bottles, it's all these other containers that need to be recycled back because the shortages are, are pretty serious. You take Foss Manufacturing in Hampton, New Hampshire, right? 500 employees in that building. Everything they do starts with flake, okay? All the fabric they make, 
there over a million square yards. I think it's a week. Wow. Okay. There's a, I mean, it's a lot. They buy 60% of their flake from overseas. Wow. Because they can't get enough of it here. Wow. And See, that's other, sad. If other states did this recycling program, then it would work out fine. No, it wouldn't because if you recycled every Coke bottle out there, we still you still wouldn't have enough. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's why we need to attack all the containers, all the things that are out there. And then, because and then, like you're saying, like all the containers like these. Egg and crates like and these. Exactly. And, and, that, and some of the fish towns are starting to do that with their single, single stream. So that you are getting that out. Correct. Um, now you can take this and clean this up one step further and take it back to food grade. Oh, you could? Yeah. You can actually turn this back into, we can go back right back into a brand new bottle. Okay. Right now we're running about 5% recycled content in our bottles. Oh, wow. Now we'd love to be 20, we'd love to be 50. You know, in a perfect world, we'd be 100, but we'll never get there, okay? But at 5%, we're actually lucky to be there. Because it's such a commodity on the marketplace. These guys buy every bit of this that comes out there. Wow. It's so difficult. Now, the Coke company, not us, but the Coke company, they actually own the largest PET processing plant in North America. And they buy bailed curbside recycling from Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, and they still can't get enough to run that plant fully because wow. there's so much demand for that material, especially up here in the Northeast and stuff. And what people need to realize is if we want to keep these great companies here, we want to keep the FOSS manufacturing and the Polartex making all that great fleece for North Face and Patagonia, if we want to keep these companies here, we have to supply them. If they've got to buy virgin material, right, this has never been used before, you're talking about three times the price. Wow. If they're forced into this, they're going to have to cut labor costs. So these beads in here are virgin material. That's virgin material. So that material. would be in comparison to, say, this, which is the chopped material. Right. This is actually what you'd buy if they had to make this without having the recyclable material. Right. In and that's why they actually go and buy flake from other countries and import it back into the U.S. And the sad thing is, PET is the most abundant plastic we bury in our landfills. Right. Now, we've got these great jobs right here. I mean, Maine yeah, has yeah. Form Fibers, which is a huge employer. Flake is what they deal with. Wow. They manufacture their car parts and their, you know, trunk inserts yep. and all that stuff. Foss Manufacturing, which is right in Hampton, New Hampshire. Polartec in Lawrence, Massachusetts and Hudson, New Hampshire. These are all industries that are right next door. Right. I mean, a lot of us know people that work there and wow. stuff. And we want to keep these companies here. Yeah. Our newest partner on the table, one of my coolest ones, is Vermont Teddy Bear. Now these were made special for me when they came on board. The neat thing about Vermont Teddy Bears are they're very unique because you can take your Vermont Teddy Bear, you can throw them in the washing machine and wash them, take them out, hang them up by his ear and let them dry and he'll never get musty or moldy. Because he's plastic. Because all the stuffing inside is made from our bottles. Oh, no kidding. And the natural antibacterial aspect of PET means that your bear, when it's dry again, will never be musty or moldy. Oh, no, if there was any kind of cotton blend in there, you'd have a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it could get bacteria growing and get other exactly. things going into it. So and that's not one, what you want to give your child. So that's the really neat thing about Vermont teddy bears, and they're a great partner of ours. I hate to see what my teddy bear looks like. I <laughs> when I was a kid, it's about 60 years old, and it's, ooh. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the hair, the, the fur The fur is, not, is an acrylic. It's, it's no, an it's acrylic. a stuffing inside. But it's a stuffing inside. That, right. Huh. Wow. Huh. So it's a, for us, it's a great partner to have yeah. because we have a lot of territory in Vermont yeah. and stuff. So, this, so that it, you know, we've got these connections to all our states with where our material goes, and that's why we're very conscious about who buys our material. We're big enough to have enough material, but we're also small enough that we can control where it goes. Wow. And when we can find yeah. great partners you do that. like this, we do that. And the thing is, most of these com or actually all of these companies that we're talking about here, they're all customers of ours. Okay. Yep. Some people have, have said, you know, well, why don't you just stop them from buying the flake and take it all back to food grade? Why would I do that to my business partners? Yeah. Okay. Bottle to bottle, I'll let the big co-company deal with that. Yeah. Okay. For us, we've got great partners that we deal with. They've been in this business doing this for a long time. We're not going to butt into that. Okay. Yeah. We would much rather continue our business with them. I'll supply them everything I can get them, make their business stronger, make our business stronger. Wow. That's our philosophy. Yeah, that's good. And it's a good philosophy. I mean, it, it is. is. And there are a lot of job opportunities, both from the bottling of the, the soft drink to 
making clothes that we wear, and I assume these are, well, I, we all know them and recognize them as being warm clothes because- Everybody they, knows North yeah, Face. Yeah, or, yeah, so I didn't know North Face was that. <laughs> Polar Tech, you told me about, but right. I didn't realize that. Wow, socks too? Socks too. Wow. 70% plastic bottles. Huh. They don't feel like that though, do they? No, they don't, not at all. <laughs> I didn't know that. Huh? Interesting, these are Earth Tech Earth socks. Earth Tech, yeah. The Eco Control socks. Mm -hmm. They keep your feet from smelling. Yep, and they're, they're cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Don't ask me how they do that, but they do. Little air conditioners that are tacked on the back here. <laughs> One of our other packages, aluminum cans. I mean, everybody knows the story in aluminum cans. Right now in the U.S., we're recycling about 65% of them. Okay, aluminum cans will always go back into aluminum cans. Um, there's like 2,200 different formulas of aluminum. So you'll never see aluminum cans go into car parts but they'll go right back into aluminum cans over and over so again. So they will be reused as yeah, a can material. Yeah, exactly, and, the, and of course there's huge demand. It only takes 5% of the energy to recreate this can. So right? there's a massive energy savings for every can you recycle. Wow. So it's very important, and again, all this processing to turn it back into this can, all right here in the Northeast. Huh. So that's why when a truck of bales leaves our building, we basically can have it full and back on the shelf again in about 30, 35 days. The same can, same same can. can material. Yeah, basically. same material. Wow, fascinating. So, that's, like I said, that's why we have s the, the manufacturing up here is great because it's all local yeah. and it's our local economy. Yeah. Something else we do, the kids love it when I talk about this. <clears throat> we'll go into a classroom and I'll ask them, what's this? I'm not answering that. <laughs> <laughs> Number one answer I get is a t test tube, yeah, yeah. which is understandable. Yeah. You can understand how, how kids can think that way. The second one answer I use, always get is a flashlight. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does look like a flashlight. Okay. This, is this, this is a different color, but just blue. Yeah, yeah same thing, yeah. okay? Yeah. This, though, is actually this. Oh, no kidding. Huh. This is how the Coke company ships our bottles around. Oh, no kidding, huh. wow. Okay, and this is done totally for efficiency of trucking. Trucking is very expensive today. Diesel fuel is expensive, trucking is unbelievably expensive. It's a huge cost to us. So the, the companies are always looking at ways to make our trucking more efficient. Okay, this is what the Coke company came up with quite a few years ago, okay? What they do is they make these, for us in the Northeast, all of these are made in Virginia, okay? Now our bottling plant is in Londonderry, New Hampshire. If you can think about trucking from yeah, Virginia to Londonderry, yeah, yeah, yeah. this or this, yeah. okay? If you're trucking this, one truck load of these turns into 10 trucks like this. We just took nine trucks off the road. Yeah, by shipping this. Yeah, yeah. And then when this goes into our plant in Londonderry, New Hampshire, it comes in, it rides down the, the, the rail, goes into a blow molder machine, right? Goes in, infrared light hits it, heats the plastic, goes into the mold, puff of air, now you've got a bottle. Huh. But when that bottle comes out of there, it goes right to the fill line, label, cap, and packaging, same. all in one process. And in our video, you'll see that. And we actually have to slow the machine down to its slowest speed so we could actually film it wow. and stuff. That's how fast it goes. But we do that right in our plant and it's all done for the simple reason of trucking. Wow, oh, that's cool. I did not know that. I knew that the, you expanded it, but I didn't know it was that small when you came yeah. out there. Like I said, that's a 20 ounce bottle on here. A two liter, a one liter, a 20 ounce, and a 12 ounce. <laughs> Jeez, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So the video that we do have that we're going to run part of this show does show that actually happening. In right, it does. And our production plant, we're pretty proud of that thing. Um, it's, it's not the newest plant in the country, but it is state of the art. And what, what we do there is incredible. Um, that plant made about 25 million cases last year. Wow. Okay? To make 25 million cases, it took over 6,000 tractor trail loads of supplies that went into that building. Okay? That's wrap, labels, caps. You know, sweeteners, flavorings, office paper, machine parts, all of that all stuff. All part of the secret formula. That all part of knows. the secret formula, exactly. So with six plus million, or six plus, plus thousand trucks going into there, boy, you would think we'd have a lot of trash left at the end of the day, right? Well, that plant runs with one eight-yard dumpster that was emptied nine times last year. Wow, really? Nine times. Wow. I mean, that's pretty incredible. That is incredible. We're at the point where our trash level is so low, to get to zero waste, Generally, you just you, um, incinerate the, the, what's left over, and that's how you get to zero. We're so good at it that we can't find somebody to take that, those nine dumpsters off our hands because it's not worthwhile for them because it's not enough. Wow. So we're, we're, we're almost too good at recycling. But at our docks, we have three tractor trailers just for recycling materials. Huh. 
and all that is processed right here wow. in the Northeast. Wow. So we're really proud of that part of the story. Be. Yeah. It, it should stuff. be. It should be. What so else we got? This is what we're doing. You know, this is about us and our partners and stuff. But doing this in schools, we, we kept getting asked about from the kids, you know, well, what happens to my recycling at home? Okay. So we brought in a curbside bin, and we have some great partners, Casella Waste and those guys, and we talked to them about what happens with the recycling and all that stuff. And some of the neat things in here, cardboard is not a big factor at home. Uh, most cardboard is an industrial thing, okay, that, that comes out of factories. Very little of it comes out of the household, so it's not a big piece of the, the equation. Mixed paper, though, that's your cereal boxes, your newspapers, magazines, your junk mail, right? That actually averages about 44% of the weight of your bin. It's a shrinking part of your bin because people aren't getting magazines anymore. They're not getting the newspaper, doing that all online. But it's an important part of the bin because for the processors that process the material in here, that pick it up and process it, right, there's actually money to be made in paper because there's so much of it, okay? As you go down the line to the right, glass. Glass is basically the recycling world's nightmare, okay? Glass has two huge problems, the weight of it. It takes a ton of diesel fuel to haul it around. It's very, very expensive. And that's why when you walk through your grocery store and you think back five years ago and then you think of today, how many products used to be in glass that yeah. are now in plastic, yeah. right? That's where it's going. That's where everybody's going. We got out of glass a long time ago and it was, we were very, it was very easy for us to get out of glass because we went to a package where you, you could put a cap back on and the consumer liked that, okay? But we got out of glass because of the expense the fuel costs and then, you know, the injuries, the back injuries, the cuts, all that kind of thing. The liquor industry has gotten out of glass. Right. Even high ends are in plastic bottles now. The beer guys tried it and it failed epically. It doesn't taste as good at it. It, it, was, it, was not, it was not pretty, but the aluminum bottle has been very successful for them. And these are, these are examples of the aluminum bottle? Or that we use. Yeah. Yeah. So the aluminum bottle has been very successful huh. for the beer guys, so that's where they're heading. The last holdouts are the wine guys. Unfortunately, for a lot of them, they're going to be forced into plastic. Eventually. Eventually. The freight cost to get the glass bottles around is just unbelievably expensive. And actually, I've done a couple of wine and food events, and the guys are very interested in preforms, hmm. these things. Because, you know, the Coke company makes preforms for other companies, not just Coke. And, you know, they've talked to wine guys now that are looking at going bottles made from this. And I think it's interesting on, on your display, you've shown kind of the value of some of these things, like right. cardboard's worth about four cents a pound. The glass is negative, it's not worth anything at all. Right, um, it's the only commodity I have to pay to get rid of. Yeah, and you know, here's the aluminum is 72 cents a pound is worth. Right. Um, and, the milk and these jug, fluctuate, these yeah. prices fluctuate all right. over the place. Milk jug's 32%, uh, 32 cents a pound. That's really fascinating to have the cost yeah. of values there because this is exactly. Gives you an idea of where the yeah. money is in yeah. the bin. But when you, you can't just think about the price because you have to start thinking about the volume too, okay? Like the three through sevens down there, the yogurt cups and butter tubs, right? It says zero value. There's actually value there. What happens is um, when, these, when the, this material gets into the plants that process it, like Eagle Maine in, Port, in Portsmouth, yeah. in Portland, they, they have machinery that separates all of I've this stuff. I've seen it. I've okay. actually watched it. It's a great it. place. It's unbelievable to watch. Okay. So when you get to those plastics, right, the plastics come through and the optical readers can read a one and they'll kick that out to a, into a different direction. They can read a two and that'll get separated out, but the, their optics don't sort three through seven. So those will get bailed together and then they, they ship those to another company who specializes in just that. And then when they separate the three from the five from the six, then they'll sell the commodities and there's value there, but it takes an extra step Wow. for most of them, okay? Tin cans, great value to them. Um, the issue there is volume. You average two tin cans per household a week. So you don't have that big volume of material. The next one, milk jugs and the cleaning bottles. This is, this is the most interesting thing going on in the bin right now, okay? Milk jugs are very valuable. These are the exact same plastic, HDPE number two, okay? Milk jugs go back into milk jugs over and over again, okay? Been doing that for a long time. This is the same plastic, but this is your laundry soap jugs and your shampoo bottles and your cleaning bottles. For the longest time, this was junk. Nobody wanted yeah, this. Yeah, that's right. And they're the same plastic. Huh. Now, most people would say, well, yeah, it's the chemicals, but it's actually not. The chemicals inside here are, in, you're washing them down your drain every day. So you can just wash it out. Okay, there's nothing toxic in there. 
The problem with these containers are the colors. The bright orange Tide bottle, the purples, the yellows, the greens, you know, the fluorescent green shampoo bottle. When you chop all that up and you melt it down, what color do you end up with? Black. Who knows? Every day yeah, it's going to be different, different, right? Yeah, yeah. Depends on how many greens and reds and whatever. So when you don't have a consistent color, how do you market that to somebody? Pretty difficult. That's right. A, you're not going to see a, yeah. yeah, you're not going to see a Tide bottle on the shelf with a brown streak in it. Not that Tide doesn't want to use it, it's just the consumer's not going to buy it. All right? So that's the problem. But being Americans, we're really good at figuring things out. And you never generally have a commodity out there that doesn't have a value to it, that somebody's not going to figure out something to do with it. And that's what these guys down in New Jersey did. These guys came up with this. Okay. Now, this is what I've nicknamed Big Boy Legos. Big Boy Legos. I loved Legos as a kid. Okay. Okay? And that's what that reminds me of. Now, this company here, Axion International, New Jersey-based company, took this material right up here to York, Maine, and built an entire bridge out of it. Every piece of this bridge is laundry soap, jugs, and shampoo bottles. No kidding. Okay? In a hundred years from now, what is this going to look like? Same thing as it looks like exactly, now. Exactly, the same thing. For the town of York, this was the same price as a steel bridge. But a steel bridge has a maintenance budget. Right. This doesn't. Wow. They're never going to scrape this because they're never going to paint it because it's not going to rot. Wow. That's fascinating. Okay? It's pretty light, too. It is. Yeah. Now, that's a steamroller on this one. Holy mackerel. Okay, that's pretty heavy. That's a 60 ton. M1 Abrams tank on a plastic bridge at Fort Bragg. Wow. <laughs> okay. That's, That's getting a little heavier. Yeah, a little bit. That's a railroad trestle right in the swamps. So it's going to carry a railroad train. Right. Now those pilings are not going to rot. There's no creosote leaching into the water. There's nothing. This is just going to sit there. Now they built their first plant in New Jersey, their second plant in Texas. Last word we got, they had started a third one, but stopped. Why? They ran out of material? They can't get enough material because we don't recycle enough. No kidding. That's sad. It is sad. And this number two HDPE is the number two most abundant plastic we bury in our landfills. And it's, and it's going to last for a lifetime in landfill. Right. right. It's, it's going to last until we dig them up because that's where we're going and stuff. And that's what the comment I, I made earlier. Portland, Maine has been digging up their landfill for three years. Yeah, okay. they're looking for metal, right? Right, now, right they're looking right, for right, metal. Right, that's correct. One third yeah. of the world's copper is buried in landfills. Not just here, but around the world. Okay? Can't stay there. Copper opened up in the market this morning at $3.31 a pound. Yeah. It's huge money. Right. Okay? We're going to go into these landfills. We're going to dig this stuff up. And when they process a landfill, they dig it up. They run it through a tremel to get the gravel out. And then they take it to a trashed energy plant like you have in Portland. Right. They burn it, everything that will burn to make electricity and stuff, and all the air is scrubbed and cleaned before it leaves. Right, right. And then out of the ash at the bottom is all the metal. So that gets shredded up, separated by magnets, and put right back out there in the industry to be reused. And that's where we're going. Yeah. The rest of the world has been mining landfills for years. Yeah. We're way behind the times on that. Yeah, I know, and I, I actually was at EcoMains landfill where I've seen them now going back into where they had for years put their, whatever had metal in it got right. burned, and so the metal just got put out into the dump, and now they're actually yep. mining that, cleaning it up. But if we can keep from burning it and exactly. going into that, we can also probably get these plastics right. out of it. Right, because at the end, the end result of trash is capturing the last bit of energy that's left in there and stuff, and that's what they're doing with burning it. But if we can use this four, five, six, seven, eight, ten times before we burn it, yeah, it makes all the That's sense. better for all of us. Well, it's like I said in the beginning, and I'll say at the end, it's not, uh, one man's trash, another man's treasure. Exactly. It's all the raw materials into a new business and a new business opportunity. You just have to think beyond the end of, the, end of your personal use of it, and where else can it be used? Correct, and that's how we look at it. What we're done with at the end of the day is what somebody else and our business partners are going to start with at the beginning of their day. Wow, fascinating. And that's what we try to do. Wow. So that's pretty much our presentation. We already talked about... PET so, and we so talked about So some of these things aluminum. that you have in here. Uh, That's just new Trex decking. Can you, can you recycle this stuff yet? <laughs> I'm um, pulling out not, of this box. Not sure. It's a plastic material, but um, you know, you, if you leave Americans alone with it, I'm sure they'll figure it out and stuff. But if you know, when you look about, at all this stuff that we have on this table and everything that we're processing and stuff, there's no end to what we can do. Um, our biggest issue out there is collection. And right now what's really playing tough with collection is the cost of diesel fuel and the cost of freight and stuff. And that has a big effect on the recycling world. 
being the size that we are, we have enough of this material, we can make it worthwhile. But when we can take what we're done with at the end of the day to a poly recovery, this little four-man outfit that now has 35 people, has two shifts, and is expanding even bigger. When we can help a small company like that build up to where they are now and then you know, where they're gonna go in the future, that's great. And then you know, go from there to FOSS Manufacturing, to Polar Tech, into North Face Jackets, Vermont Teddy Bears. It, doesn't for, it can't get better than that. Well, and in, in what, what you've described as I have worked with single sort now yep. is that, to me, I think that's the future. That's my personal exactly. thing. Because I see all of, I don't have to think about where things go. I can throw it in one bin. I can't throw the plastic bags in, right. but you've given us a solution. And I got to talk to our guys when we go home saying, why don't we, we do collect those, but rather than throw them in the trash, let's dig them in and figure out a way to get them out of it because they are of value. Right. But that we're, we're letting it so people can throw it out right easily. Correct. If you make it complicated, if you make it so they have to think about it. Now, right. we all had, the, we used to have the bins in Wilton mm -hmm. where people would come in and put paper in here and newspaper in there and cardboard here and plastic bottles there, but it was an effort. And right. you had to go think. Now, some of us are pretty dedicated to trying to make that happen. But with single sort, we go into one place. You take put it, it all in. Just put it all in. I mean, I, I, I've been cleaning my house about, about, about time, somebody would say. Mm -hmm. And I have brought more paper and stuff to recycle. And I don't know if I would have done it to the same magnitude if I had to keep sorting it all the right. time. So I put it in one container. I take it down and I dump it in the single sort. And then I got the opportunity to visit Ecomain. Mm -hmm. I saw the single sort. I saw, and, and people think, okay, well, they're sending it, and there's going to be all these pickers. Well, right. No. It's, it's very very technical. Very a lot technical. of technology. I mean, they have the ability to take paper out just by the fact that they blow air through it. Or they go to the plastics, and they're able to do different things that sort it out. And then they bundle it up at the end. They take the cardboard. And at the very end, there's a picking line looking for things that are high value or for somehow got through. Right. When you have two bottles, there are two different types of bottles that are bent and folded together, together, that kind that, of thing. That kind of thing. So it's, it's, very, it's not labor intensive, per se. It's, it's machine intensive for us to go forward. So mm -hmm. it, it works out pretty cool, and it's pretty neat to see. But we've made it so it's easy to throw it out right, and that becomes very, very important in this It does. Time. You generally see an increase in recycling when you go to single stream of anywhere between 25 and 40 percent in a town. And I, from our, our own experience, my wife and I live in Manchester, New Hampshire. And about a year and a half, two years ago, we went from dual stream, two different bins, to single stream, one 96-gallon cart with a cover, right? It is amazing the amount of trash that is not around anymore because we put out our bins on Mondays, and if it was windy, I'd come home, and not only would I have half our bins <laughs> flying around the yard, but where we live, all our neighbors stuff flies into our yard, like just like in the fall. We pick up our leaves plus all our neighbors' leaves because nice they all blow that I way. Have one of I, I, I send mine to my someone else. Yeah. No, see, there you go. Um, but with that 96-gallon cart and a cover, we don't have that anymore. Yeah. There's nothing blowing around on windy right. days. It all stays inside there, and it makes the whole neighborhood a lot cleaner. Yeah. And that's you know, one of those side effects that people don't think about. It's true. I mean, it really is true that with, with that part of it. And, and I think the other part that is like you just described, that these are the the uh, containers that we need, right. this would go in the trash. When my house, because we didn't have a place to take it. Right. And it, oftentimes it'd have some food contamination in it, but now it doesn't matter. No, it so doesn't. Just throw it right in again. When you figure, when, when, when they recycle this bottle, right, when they go through the wash process, they've got that small bit of glue that's on here. Well, they've got a wash to get that out. So the syrup that's inside isn't a big deal. The peanut butter that's in your peanut butter jar isn't as difficult to get out as the glue that's holding the label on. So the cleaning processes are built for that. Um, you know, you want to keep things, you know, halfway neat and clean before you throw them in the bin. But you don't need to put it through the dishwasher because now you're just burning up energy. Right. To you wash know, it out. Exactly. I haven't thought about that because that's what, I mean, in these things it's funny because you can't put them in the dishwasher. because no, when they can't. come out, They kind of come all crumpled yeah, up. Yeah, they may be like, all melted they down. Like the, they don't like the heat at all because no. I was actually going to use them for planters because they make nice planters. But when they mm. came out, they're kind of narrowly and twisted up and so right. forth. I mean, what fascinates me with what you've got here is this, the shoes. <laughs> I don't know why, because I've seen these shoes, and I've always thought, oh, geez, look, they made wool shoes. Mm -hmm. And uh, now knowing that that's really And that's, that's a production model. The new ones are blue and fluorescent oh. green and pink. Ah. And, oh, yeah, they're, they're all decked out now. That was a production model shoe. 
So they're able to, to, and it's an American company. They're right here in Maine, in Orange Walk. I'm, they may, I don't think they make these shoes up there, but uh, these are very, they're neat shoes. They're mm -hmm. very light. And most people are fascinated that we still do that here. Yeah, well, it is. And we're one of the few companies that still do that. And then I think what also fascinates me with all of this is the name brands that, that, that I did not realize were made from these recycled materials, the Polar right here. of the world, the North Faces of the world, because these are things that we all wear. Yeah. I mean, I see more North Face coats out there with people on, and now I know, and people will know that they are actually made from recycled materials, which right. are pretty cool. And they'll last a lifetime. They will. Really. And when, when, I, when we go into classrooms, you know, we can really connect with the kids. When you sit in there and you say, you're a North Face jacket, you're a North Face jacket, you're a Patagonia jacket, guess what's making that? Yeah, yeah, probably yeah. our Coke bottles. Yeah, yeah. And now, stuff. we're going to run, we have some, just really quickly as we get ready to run the show, that we have two videos we're going to run that, that right. deal with this. And, and their first one, real quick. I'm, the first one is actually this story right here. How it, okay? it goes, right. But what makes it great is we didn't film a, me talking about this. We actually filmed right at, right at Polar Tech and Lawrence. We filmed in the factory. We filmed in the factory of Foss Manufacturing. So people actually see it, Ken Dunn. You'll it. see the guys at Poly Recovery, the great group over there, and what they do over there, and all that. Ultra Pet, the, the company that processes our bottles, you'll see that process being done. Wow. And stuff. So kids really like it. And your second one? The second one is a special project that the Coke company is doing, and we like it because it's Dean Kamen, it's DECA, which is a Manchester, New Hampshire-based company right here. Dean Kamen and his brother invented the kidney dialysis machine, as well as the Segway scooter. Okay? They've worked with the Coke company for a lot of years for different projects, and their newest project is a water purification unit. It's just a small unit. It's probably this wide, this long, maybe this high. And the neat thing about that is it's very inexpensive. You can take it all over the world. It can run off electricity, solar, propane. It, you know, there's all different methods. But the neat thing about it is you can take the hose for that unit, throw it in the ocean, throw it in the swamp, throw it in the mud puddle, doesn't matter. It will purify any water that it takes in. And the neat thing is in a village, you can wash your clothes, take that wash water, throw it back into the machine, purify it again, cook dinner with it, wash all your dishes, throw that water back in the machine again, purify it again, and then wash the kids up before they go to bed. And, and what, what we, I want to include in the show, it's, it's in a sense another recycling opportunity that Absolutely. may not be directly related to what we talked about here. Question for you, website that someone can go to that if they want to see this, do we have one? Yeah, we, our um, company website is www.ccnne.com. If you bring up the website, if you look on the right-hand side, there's a button that says corporate involvement. If you click there, our video comes up next. So if you want to watch the video, that's a great place to go look at it. And it's running at the bottom of the screen right now, as I always joke with the guys here, that that's where it is. How can somebody get in touch with you if they wanted you to come up and do another special show like you've done? <laughs> um, email me. Um, my email address is rdube at ccnne.com. And we'll run that at the bottom of the screen. And like I said, we do this in schools. We do this. I was at Pratt & Whitney, the jet engine plant, yesterday in Middletown, Connecticut. We go into hospitals. And, you know, we just go out. We do this. We have a great time. And, and you just, just went tell to the for your presentation. I did. Um, IDEX Labs in Portland. Uh, they do a big sustainability presentation every, uh, thing every, every year. They invite all their vendors to come in and show off their sustainability practices and all that. Last year was our first year there, and this is a great company, 800 plus employees um, right in Portland. Um, last year was our first year there. We actually won. Last week, we were back there again for the second year, and we actually came in first place again. Super. And it's an employee voted award. So it was really neat to get that. It really makes me special, because this is my baby. Yeah. I mean, this is my passion. I'm sure you can pick that up. No, I can't <laughs> tell at all. I thought this is something bored you to death. Yeah. And, and you've, you've been kind enough uh, through Coke to come up and you're actually going to go to, to, school system, uh, to a school system with me this afternoon. Yeah, we got two classes today we're going to present to. Well, Ray, I, I just appreciate this. This is, you know, what we saw at the State House, and I think the public's got an opportunity to see where we re true sustainability and recycling is being done. And um, if you have any questions or anything, sure, send an email to Ray. Don't call me because I'll get you confused. <laughs> Ray, thanks for coming on my show. Thanks for having this me. This was pleasure. great. This is great. And I look forward to the next show when you have even more stuff to show us. All right. This is Tom Saviello for Talk in Maine and the Bowtie Boys. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Now you know where your plastic bottles go. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. What surprised me most in digging into our sustainability practices 
is all of the other businesses and employees whom we impact in the northern New England market. I've always said it's our waste, let's keep it here. Um, let's create the jobs here, let's, let's create the, and stimulate the, the local economy. We're entrenched in the communities, we're involved very actively in the communities that, we, that we're fortunate to live in and do business in. We were sustainable before people even realized what sustainability was. It's just, it was just the culture of the company for us, Coke Northern New England, that started back in the 70s. What we have to focus on as a, as a community, as a country, is recycling efforts. I love what I do. I know we have a positive impact on our local environment and our countryside as a whole. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing and I'm glad to be a part of it. The innovation started with what can we do with a plastic bottle? We've turned that plastic bottle into the jacket that I'm wearing now. What Coca-Cola is doing is, is unlike a lot of companies out there. In fact, they're a leader in, in uh, recycling and, and they really care. For sustainability, it really starts with highlighting that at, uh, at the top of our organizations, whether it be at our production facility or at our various sales centers, and really highlighting things that are important to us as a company, whether it's recycling initiatives, reduction in miles driven. Everybody feels comfortable understanding that sustainability is a really a core competency for this company. Back late in 2011, we got the approval to um, purchase a blow molder, and in doing so, We've saved about 1,500 truckloads a year of full bottles being brought into the plant. Um, that ratio is about 10 truckloads of bottles to one truckload of preforms. One of the things we're really proud of here at London Air is our ability to reduce uh, solid waste. We're able to recycle about 92% of what everything that comes into this plant. Um, what comes into this plant is about 6,000 truckloads a year of packaging material, concentrate, and other goods, and only nine dumpsters leave in a year. So, um, you know, that's a pretty good ratio, and we're hoping to improve that as the years go on. We purchase on an annual basis about um, four to 450 vending machines and about 1,300 coolers each year. And when we are ordering that amount of equipment, we want to make sure that we are getting the most efficient, the most valuable pieces of equipment that we have that we can give to our customers. We have been able to reduce our mileage by 700,000 miles in the last few years. So sustainability here at the London Dairy facility is really about energy saving, water, and waste reduction. It's really a, a focus with all of our people on a major recycling effort. We've done that over the last six to ten years, been able to reduce our solid waste by 80% during that time frame, recycling everything from PET bottles to aluminum to the strapping and stretch film, all the materials that come into the plant we find the avenues to recycle them. We recycle because of a lot of reasons. Um, we have six million pounds of PET bottles that we processed last year and we sold out to the marketplace. Four plus million pounds of aluminum cans, all our cardboard, all our shrink wrap. We've been recycling these 30 plus years. Everything that I'm putting back out there into the marketplace is so tied to our local economy up here in the Northeast. Frost Manufacturing was founded in 1952 right here in New England. Uh, we've been a New England company uh, for uh, over 50 years now. Uh, we are located currently in Hampton, New Hampshire, where we've been since the early uh, 70s. We employ approximately 500 employees, and we manufacture over a million square yards of fabrics per week that leave this facility and go to a variety of different customers and marketplaces. And one great example is a shoe that we're making now for New Balance. We're actually taking um, a needle punch non-woven fabric that's made out of recycled bottles, we're coloring it, needle punching it, and creating a fabric out of it, and it's making the whole upper of the shoe. And it's called New Sky by New Balance, and we're very proud that we're the fabric that's making the upper of that. One of our uh, issues today is finding enough bottle resin to keep our plants running at the levels we want and with the products that we're making. Uh, we currently buy a lot of uh, recycled bottles from companies that are right here in New England themselves. Uh, Poly Recovery, that is just about 10 miles north of here, is one of our main sources for some of the recycled uh, bottles that we acquire. A lot of those bottles come from Coca-Cola. The uh, largest misconception about plastic is that it's ending up in a landfill, uh, which is just not true. Uh, plastic, especially PET, is one of the easiest things to recycle. 
we have the ability to process it all day long. The relationship that, that we've developed with the likes of Coca-Cola and here at Poly Recovery and then down the road at Foss Manufacturing, we're creating a process where we are recycling it right here in everybody's backyard. It's not just sustainable in environmental, it's sustainable economically uh, because you're creating more jobs and you're keeping these local cluster groups um, and essentially building your community. No one does that better than Coca-Cola. Polar Tech was the inventor of fleece. In 1981, we worked with Patagonia to really invent modern synthetic fleece. Since then, we've been working on uh, all kinds of fabric innovations from waterproof breathable fabrics to additional high loft fleeces, recycled fleece. 50% of what we make on a daily basis out of our Lawrence, Massachusetts facility is made from PET plastic. We buy millions of pounds of yarn from Unify Reprieve. We turn that yarn into fabric and sell it to the best brands around the globe. We're the largest independent post-consumer PET processor in North America. We specialize in PET, that's all we do. What we're looking for is more containers at all time, and we do about two billion containers a year. That's about 80 million pounds. But I think the life cycle of a plastic bottle is, uh, is very unique. Let's start out with a, uh, with a Northern New England Coke bottle. Coke will basically get the bottle from one of their converters, they'll fill it, they'll sell the product. The consumer will take that product, consume it, and then return that bottle. And then it winds up in the waste stream. And then we will basically buy that bottle. And that bottle comes back in here in, uh, in typically, say, a baled form. And now we're going to take that bottle and we're going to break it down and we're going to try to recover the individual PET resin that, that it started with. That resin will be basically converted back into a wash flake or a, a milk filtered pellet and we're going to sell back to companies uh, a company like Foss who's going to use it to make say fine denier fibers or it's going to go to a company that's going to inject and mold it back in the free form make a bottle it'll go back to coca-cola and we'll start the process all over again. Today polyester water bottles can be 100 percent recycled and used into products that the consumer is buying every single day and what people of this nation need to understand is that there's not enough of it for the demand that we have for polyester fiber. We need more recycling efforts, we need more recycled bottles uh, for a lot of the applications that we make here at Foss. People don't get it. I think they get the wrong impression on plastic bottles that there might be uh, you know, an issue or it's evil because it doesn't biodegrade, but there's a huge market. Uh, there's not a bottle that can be collected that you can't recycle it back into usable form. For me to be able to provide that to them instead of throwing it into a landfill is, is just, it's great. It makes me feel good about what I do. We go out of our way to recycle like crazy, not just the beverage containers that we sell and deliver, but also all of the ancillary materials uh, involved in, in the manufacturing and, and in our business. We think plastic is a pretty great material. Uh, look at the amazing things that can be done with it. What we like to see and we advocate and we will support is increased recycling at the local level so that more plastic bottles more aluminum cans can be recovered and put to great use. Casella has been recycling for over 40 years, but the evolution of technology and efforts, it's allowed the customers to recycle more, to make it easier. It's just the right thing to do. Using Zero Sort, it's a very direct movement. It goes from the collection site, whether it be the home or business, right to the processing facility. It removes a lot of handling in between. The capture rates go up, and it's, we have the ease of processing with modern technology. Zero Sort's important because it collects more material. The other great thing about Zero Sort is it makes it easier for the people to recycle more material. Sustainability to me is just doing things right as far as what we do with our material before, how we process, what we do with what's left over at the end of the day. This company gives me great support and sustainability methods uh, and being and, and continuing that effort going forward. Sustainability, it's, it's you know, our customers demand it. Uh, it's the right thing to do, our people want it, and it's, it's just the right way to conduct business. Good, solid sustainability practices are an expectation from both our customers and our consumers. They're expecting the folks that they purchase products from to have good sustainability programs. We know it's important to encourage all of our associates around the importance of sustainability and encourage them to really live that only here at work, 
but hopefully it, it translates into their lives as well. What's important to me is we continue to engage in the conversation with our customers and consumers. I love what I do. When we can physically go out and touch where our material goes, for us to be able to help them grow the way they've been growing, it's, it's again, it's just one of those things that really makes me feel good about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. From a very early age, I both wanted to know more and more about the rules by which this universe of ours operates. And through the world of engineering, I wanted to start applying those rules to create inventions that would give people a better quality of life if those inventions work. Why is everybody saying that there's a looming water shortage, okay? Why? Well. How about 50% of all human disease on this planet today is a result of waterborne pathogens? Bad water is responsible for two million deaths per year, and almost all of them are kids under five years old. I didn't get up one day and say, gee, we ought to work on the world's water problems. We were working on a way to make home dialysis a possibility. It worked. But once we realized we could take everything out of water, no matter what it is, organics, toxins, that same machine could be carried into villages and allow a few billion people to have the purest water in the world. Our device literally boils the water the way the sun does. It turns it into steam. We then compress it and turn it back into liquid and that's pure distilled water, just like rainwater. And we leave behind the bad stuff. You stick a hose into anything that looks wet a anywhere puddle. in the world, a puddle, the ocean, the ocean uh, uh, a chemical a waste site. A 50-gallon drum a, of urine. A 50-gallon <laughs> drum of urine. Okay. Global organizations, I don't think, understand that the 21st century problem needs a 21st century solution. They work on top-down, government-to-government, big programs. And we're working on the slingshot, the little tool that David needs to take on Goliath. We agreed with the Coca-Cola company that we would go out and build 15 machines to be used in trials in Ghana. And from there, depending on how those trials go, we're moving to other places around Africa and Central America. first images came back and we saw a crowd of excited kids smiling and laughing and watching these kids just guzzle this water down. Everybody just sat there and looked and realized that our ideas are one step closer to reality. We could empty half of all the beds in all the hospitals in the world by just giving people clean water.